of our participants who are here to share out their stories, and you all are going to be able to have a little bit of a taste of what it's like to be in an Interrupting Privilege seminar as well. So I wanted to introduce Laura Irwin, who played a really important part in the creation and design of the website. Uh, and Laura is going to take us, hopefully, through a quick tour of the website. Coming back. Okay. So just walking through the website, um, I'll also share some of the decisions that I made when it came to coming up with some of the images, some of the text, some of the quotes that I used and pulled, um, and as well as um, navigating these tabs up above. Immediately going onto the website on the home page, you will scroll down and the first thing you will see are all of these sort of image cards. You click on the image card and um, it will leave you to, it will lead you, hey there friend, <laughs> a specific post for every single uh, audio. There are nearly 200 audios on this website. Um, all of them are different and all of them have the same image card. It's the exact same layout. In each post, you will find a brief synopsis of what you'll hear in the clip along with a pull quote um, directly from the clip. And then, just scrolling a little bit down, you can go here at the clip here um, on the SoundCloud website uh, and page for the CCDE. Um, scrolling through this home page, you can actually load nearly all of the image cards and posts and browse in this way. And if <laughs> you're not interested in doing that, you can go up to this themes button. We have all of these themes and have sort of categorized every single one of the clips into one of these number of themes available. Um, we also have our methodology, a quick discussion of that, our about page, and then um, one of these cool parts here is a blog which will lead you to different posts from different members of the CCDE who have um, contributed. If you just click on that post, it will lead you to a brief synopsis of what you could continue reading on a separate website. And back through here, one of the most important parts, the about page where we discuss um, sort of what it is that Interrupting Privilege has done and then a special thanks as well to all of the contributors and people who have participated uh, with the research as well as uh, funding. And, and we do want to pause here for a second to thank um, all of the people who have really made this happen. This has been years in the making, and we're so grateful for our funders. We have a number of individual donors who have made this happen. We also have to thank the Population University of Washington's Population Health Initiative, um, uh, ACLS and Mellon Scholars and Society Program, the Communication Department. We have um, a new sponsor, the, um, the Mind and Life Foundation, and the University of Washington Diversity Seed Grant. Uh, we also have had um, a, a tremendous amount of, um, of different students, undergraduates, graduate students in the communication department, in social work, in political science, in education, really across the board. And all of this work would not be possible without, um, without them and all of their hard work. And then also to let you know that our participants have come from a wide variety of places. As you listen to these stories, you will hear um, local um, elementary school students middle school students, high school students, community college students, um, University of Washington undergraduates, graduate students, and community members from all different walks of life. So um, we're really, really pleased that, that so many different people came in and partnered with us, partnered with us through the Northwest African American Museum, and partnered with us through University of Washington's Alumni Association. So um, we had many, many partners in making this happen, and, um, and this work has really happened with um, and through and by our community. We're very grateful for that. Yeah. 
And so with that, we're going to go ahead and segue into a video from our president of the University of Washington. Hello, I wish I could be with you all to celebrate the launch of the Interrupting Privilege website. This program is doing the difficult and essential work of bringing challenging conversations and ideas. Something that we often hear is that we need to create dialogues. Well, that's easy to say, but hard to put into practice. And I'm very proud of the great work that interrupting privilege is doing to make these needed conversations a reality. Rich, candid, meaningful conversation about race is absolutely crucial for advancing a more diverse, inclusive, and equitable world. And these values are central to our public mission as a university, as well as to us as human beings. Part of the way that privilege manifests is in who gets to speak and whose voices are heard. Creating space for marginalized voices and perspectives can interrupt that privilege and change the narratives that dominate our society. One of the most important aspects of this project is in the intersectional nature of these conversations. Privilege and power exist along many axes, race, class, age, gender, education, and so on. Creating space for intergenerational dialogues and for people's own accounts of their lived experience helps to preserve precious stories and fosters empathy and understanding, something that we urgently need Congratulations to everyone whose hard work has culminated in the launch of this outstanding community resource. Your work embodies the university's commitment to community engagement, diversity, and equity. And this methodology demonstrates how research and equity work can involve community members as equal partners, a model for future projects. I can't wait to see the exciting outcomes of these conversations and the action and impact that they will inspire. So, so uh, President Kelsey uh, uh, wanted to be here tonight, and she actually, uh, I, I know the, the video, but, but she actually participated in the very first project, so our very first project, um, that was along the theme of the first time that you've experienced racial discrimination. And I, I had the privilege of actually being partnered with her for this dialogue, and so she was, she was very open and honest and shared out her experience um, and is, is committed to this project. And with that, I just wanted to, um, to tell you a little bit about our themes as we've been through a number of different themes over the years. That was our very first theme. And as a matter of fact, we started doing this project because of the work of one of our graduate students, our former graduate student, who is now an assistant professor at the University of Washington, I mean University of Washington, University of Wisconsin Parkside, Anjali Brecky, who is right, right here. <laughs> And Anjali's dissertation was on um, listening and StoryCorps. And we wanted to be able to support her at the center as we like to try and do with our students. And it really grew into this way to support the Interrupting Privilege Program. And, and Anjali brought in this key element of listening that you all are gonna be participating in. So our first year was uh, around, with, in partnership with Anjali, was around the first time that you experienced racial discrimination. From then, we did a project on Generation Mix Goes to School, and so that was with uh, K-12 kids, and we brought kids in to do these same types of dialogues. I was hoping to have um, a couple of kid participants, but it's a little bit of a harder sell to get kids to stand up here and their parents to agree to it as well. Um, but, but that was a wonderful project. You can listen to their stories as well. 
After that, we transitioned to doing a project on black in Seattle and being black in Seattle, and that was when we had um, high school students, um, students from community college, um, students from University of Washington, and a number of community members at the Northwest African American Museum. We were going to do that for the year, and then COVID hit. So COVID hit, we did a transition, and as we began to understand that this pandemic was disproportionately affecting African American communities, we realized that we needed to talk about the disproportionality of COVID, but also the race crisis. So we shifted and started talking about community care. And that became the focus of our next year. And that work on community care and really hearing how we needed to care for communities in the language of quarantining while black, which Jazz Moultrie, our RA, named it so beautifully, so that became our, our last year's focus, transitioned into our partnership that we're beginning this year with the University of Washington's Resilience Lab. Megan Kennedy right here is our director. And so we're gonna be really thinking about how do we take pieces of interrupting privilege, and in particular, the last piece on interrupting microaggressions, and pair them with strategies on mindfulness and, and compassion and self-compassion in particular, um, and thinking about how can we take care of ourselves as we are fighting racism. Uh, and we're trying to, as always, be really attuned to what our community needs. I'm also gonna put another person on the spot who I see right over here. We have so many incredible people here. Uh, Dr. Dr. Holly Ferraro is, is behind me, who is um, a Seattle University professor and will soon be moving to Villanova. And we're actually hoping to start doing a satellite program as well, um, talking in particular around black capitalism and doing a program in Philly and a program in Seattle um, possibly down here at the Commons, while we're also doing some work on resilience. So that's a little bit of what we are doing right now here in our program um, in a community-engaged manner, and um, we have many, many participants here. If you haven't participated, we would love to invite you into our spaces. So I think with that, we are going to transition to our first clips and our first exercise. So, um, gentlemen, would you guys mind coming up to the front? <laughs> I'm sorry. So, so we have um, participants from three of our different projects speaking here today. From the very first project, which was, it was themed in this space the first time that you ever remember experiencing discrimination. But the way that we do the dialogic interviews is really about trying to foster egalitarian conversations where we might start with a prompt, but they might go somewhere totally different. And so we had um, uh, oh, these two gentlemen, you're just gonna meet in, in right now, I'm going to actually introduce properly, um, who participated. Okay, now you have to be embarrassed while I'm, I'm reading your bios. I'm so sorry, okay. All right, so, uh, uh, <laughs> Marvin was in a conversation with Marcus, and, um, and Marcus was uh, Marvin's uh, mentor at the time. Uh, Marvin Marshall is a Seattle native. He attended the University of Washington. Um, he was a former member of the Center for Communication, Difference, and Equity. Um, and not only as a former member, but he um, participated in Interrupting Privilege, and he was one of my honors students. Um, Marvin enjoyed meeting new people and using his voice to bring people together. Since graduation, Marvin has had the privilege of volunteering and working in different roles to help underserved populations. He has seven years of professional and volunteer experience working to support youth and young adults in different capacities. Currently, he works as the Director of Violence Prevention Programs for Youth and Young Adults at the YMCA of Greater Seattle. In social services, Marvin is given the opportunity to bring communities together and advocate for those whose voice is often unheard. And this was really the scholarship that, that, that Marvin was doing as well. And then uh, Marcus Johnson is a PhD candidate in the Department of Communication. He specializes in critical cultural communication, cultural studies, and critical race theory. 
As a facilitator, um, Johnson spent two years working for the Center for Communication Difference and Equity, conducting workshops and classes on interrupting microaggressions and privilege, and these received a 2017 Silver Case Award for the Circle of Excellence. Uh, he's currently a doctoral candidate in the University of Washington's Department of Communication. That means he is finishing up his dissertation um, as we speak right now. He earned his BA in Global Studies and MA in Cultural Studies from the University of Washington Bothell. Uh, he's a Mary Gates Scholar, a 2018-19 Mellon Scholar, and his work centers on race, gender, and identity, including uh, work on the multi-dimensions of blackness, cultural hegemony in the United States and abroad, and work on the Dominican Republic. And he's writing a fascinating dissertation on Do the Right Thing right now. So we are, in, and uh, so we're gonna go ahead and listen to their conversation. Are you guys ready to go? All right, so, so part of the instructions that we, we give participants, you guys can, can, can sit down if you want. So we can do the condition. Um, part of the instructions that we give participants um, as you are listening is to try and put all of your intention um, into their words. That might mean that you wanna close your eyes, that might mean that you want to take notes. Um, but what you're trying to do is to pause any moments of judgment, of assessment, of even agreement, much less disagreement. You are trying to fully hear what they're saying and what their story is. So after this, you're going to get a chance to turn to each other and talk for a little bit, and then we're going we're gonna to hear um, from Marvin and Marshall about, about their, their quotes. just briefly like this transition from after being incarcerated to uh, academic institution how did you make that transition from that space to this space right a different environment different set of rules uh, did it, I know it took probably some time to adjust so making that transition and then just speaking a little bit to like kind of where do you see yourself you know you talked a little bit about grad school um, honor thesis um, and so how has this like kind of reshaped the way you see the world? Being on this campus, but not even on this campus, but just in the city, I always feel like there's eyes on me as a black man in America, you know. Just me personally, I'm always trying to live up to or exceed those negative stereotypes of the black man. I'm always cognizant of that and trying to exceed that by leaps and bounds, you know. So I think that experience or that frame of mind has caused me to always constantly be code switching. You know, I'm aware of my audience and how I come across. You know, now while I have my own sense of style and I am who I am, I am aware that the way I might talk to my friends is not necessarily the way I'm gonna talk to my professors or even to my classmates in school, you know? And so I think that that code switching is something I should put on my resume, but it's a trait that I, uh, think allows me to be in those different spaces and to be able to navigate those different institutions, you know. Yeah, and, and code switching, for those that don't know, it's uh, awareness of two different worlds, of being in separate spaces um, and having to function in those spaces in particular ways based on seeing the world through a perspective that isn't widely shared um, throughout the United States and uh, for people outside of oppressed communities. So it's uh, a way of communicating in code uh, and a way of feeling comfortable. And it's a really important part of, uh, you identify as a black male, I identify as a black male, a really important tool um, in terms of identity and being able to function in these different spaces. Speak a little bit to growing up, did you have a particular idol? Did, was there somebody you idolized that you wanted to grow up to be like? And then thinking about where you're at right now uh, in the University of Washington, let's speak a little bit to like the next step, some of the work you're doing. Growing up, I guess I did not have any any idols, any role models. I mean, of course, as a kid, you look up to athletes, you know, famous athletes. But for the most part, I didn't have any idols that, you know, were just in my life and prevalent and for me to be able to see and envision myself in that space. I guess that's partly what, is fueling me, I guess, because I feel like mentorship is big, especially in the black community.
ended a bit abruptly, but we were ending it on community. And it is a, it's a longer, um, a longer clip. It's a beautiful clip that you all can listen to in its entirety uh, online. But we wanted to, to, to stop right there. And, um, and to give you all an opportunity to, to turn to each other. And um, for those of you all who are online as well, I know that Michelle is creating the breakout rooms for you all in pairs. And just say, um, what did you hear? What did you hear? If we were doing this, we have a whole mode of doing, um, of listening that we, we don't have time for, unfortunately, that we would do if we were actually doing the Interrupting Privilege program. But go ahead and just turn to the person next to you. If you don't know them, go ahead and introduce yourself and say, uh, what did you hear there? We'll have the, the folks who are in their breakout rooms come back. And what we're going to do now is invite um, Marvin and Marcus uh, back up to the front. And you all can share whatever you would like right now. You can, yep, you can take a seat and make it comfortable. Pull up another big chair. Is there another matching one over there? Um, you can talk about what you all heard there. You can update us. Part of what we're trying to do is to give folks this opportunity to take themselves. We are, we are all of us are, are who, who are working the CCD are scholars of representation. So this is kind of the moment outside of representation. Uh, oh, this is bad. All right. <laughs> uh, one of the things we'll just talk a little bit about in our group. Uh, this was actually our first time hearing this since like 2017 or 2018 when we first recorded it. And one of the things that came up was like this sense of surveillance of constantly being watched. Uh, and then also um, self-awareness as Marvin talked about. So that was one of the things that came up for us. Yeah, definitely that. Um <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> That, um, that self-awareness is definitely something that is, you know, ran true. Also, when we talk about code switching, you know, um, I made a joke about putting it on my resume, you know, but part of me is also torn in a sense, like, why do I have to code switch? You know, um, how much do I need to fit in? You know, what does that look like, really? You know, and how accepting are we of black culture? You know, and so I'm making a joke of it. And I do, you know, don't get me wrong, think that it is necessary for a young um, black person or person of color to be able to navigate in certain spaces, but part of me is torn, you know? Why do I have to do that, you know? And so I thought it was a good thing in the beginning, like, that's great, I can definitely navigate these different spaces. But then part of me is just wondering, why am I still stuck in that hamster wheel, you know? And so it's definitely rough. Um, it definitely ties to a much larger conversation. Um, Marcus and I sat, I think it was like 45 minutes that day. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe even a little longer. I think it was edited down to like 45 minutes, you know, so it was definitely powerful to hear that little piece of um, time. And mm -hmm. like we talked about in our uh, group, it definitely still rings true. You know, while this was a few years ago with so much going on then and so much has happened since then, you know, it's still, I still feel the same way today, you know, like the youngsters would say, to this day, you know, <laughs> so that's just something I picked up on. Yeah, we, we, we also um, talked about you know, still being in a pandemic and all the kind of racialized violence and uh, the protests and there's major trials going on right now that, you know, many of us are all glued to the television watching to see what the decisions are of really not having a code switch in a sense of just telling people how it is, how you feel, and not really caring about the consequences so much anymore, um, being, you know, the way things have shaped up and that we're moving back into society in a different kind of way. Some people don't even know how to talk to people anymore. You know, it's just kind of a weird space where you're like, oh, what do I say? How do I respond? How do I react? Because uh, in the past couple of years, there's been so many things that transpired. Um, so, you know, it's a combination of both code switching and not feeling the, the obligation to code switch anymore. And also this heightened sense of surveillance and constantly being watched, which is becoming a, a lot more normalized and 
things like traffic cameras and stuff like that. So, thank you. <laughs> so we wanted to open it up, and um, we're going to try and see if we can engage both our online and our in-person audiences here to the best of our abilities. And we will start see if we can maybe uh, alternate back and forth with comments or questions. So comments for things that you all were talking about that you might want to share out, and then questions for the gentleman here. And please introduce yourself. Should, um, maybe uh, you should stand up and take the mic and just hand it to you. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know I was, I was, I was going to go Is it running? OK. Hello, America. <laughs> I'm sorry. My name is Christopher Irwin, and I'm really in, in, uh, intrigued by the last comment that you made. Uh, you said you, when you have to, when you make the decision not to coach, which you don't feel like it. In that in that moment of making that decision, um, can you describe what's going through your mind? Uh, consequences, um, uh, the energy it takes to to execute that decision. Can you just run us through all that? Yeah, I would say I think sitting in the house, writing and reading about like the death of Radio Raheem and working on, uh, you know, do the right thing. Uh, I just watching the George Floyd uh, situation, Brianna, like all the things. I think at some point I just got, you know, I got tired of playing the game because there's a certain game, and we talked about this earlier, that you have to play and navigate, especially in the academia and research foreign institutions. And as you move through the world as a black person, you have to kind of play this game. And sometimes you can play that game and still not get the results that you want. So I think me, when I'm calling people in and calling them out, I'm at that point where I just don't, where for me, it's like, I'm tired of playing this game. Definitely, and for me, I think it more so depends case by case on the setting. What's the scenario? What is my message? How effective will it be if I don't? Um, and then sometimes there's other variables like emotion that kick in that just don't allow you to process it like that. You know, but I think at the end of the day, it's more so about how effective my message is. Because it's about, uh, it's about effective communication. That's why you code switch anyway, you know, so that you can tailor your message to the audience that, you know, is receiving it. And so I think um, when you have the time to process it like such, the effectiveness of the message is, I think, what would kind of depend on, you know, and then other things like setting, you know, if you're at work, you're talking to your boss, you know, things of that nature, but yeah, the effectiveness of the message. Thank you. Do we have an, an online question or comment? There's a comment from um, Resonant, uh, a few comments um, resonating. Uh, I hear that playing the game is exhausting, says Tamika. We have time for if anybody else has a, a question or comment before we listen to the second one. Does anyone want to share or ask anything? <laughs> <laughs> All right. This, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> and Jazz, do you want to come and share? We have a quick announcement as we are switching over between clips. So uh, really briefly, we have some posters in the back. My voice sounds so cool on this mic. <laughs> OK, all right. So one says, how do we engage in radical listening, which is something that we're practicing here right now. And also the other says, interrupting privilege in action. So back there on the table, we have sticky notes, markers. And I encourage each and every one of you to go in there and just, just share how, what ways in which you're engaging radical listening today or in your daily practice and the ways in which you interrupt privilege as well. Oh yes, and those of you online, I encourage you to do the same thing as well with us on social, um, Twitter and Instagram at UWCCDE. Um, oh, just share with us as well how you're engaging in radical listening and the ways in which you interrupt privilege as well. I said it wrong. Anyways, thank you. Thank you. 
And uh, those of you who are um, online, um, at UWCCBE on um, both Twitter and Instagram, and Jazz has been doing a magnificent job of, of keeping us all on, um, on the socials. Okay, so we are gonna transition to our second speaker. You wanna stand up for just a second while I read your bio? <laughs> I just like I just love everyone who's here, and I'm just so I'm just so pleased. I'm so thrilled. So um, Alexandria was a participant in our well, what ended up being our uh, fourth and fifth projects because of that thing called the pandemic. So we ended up kind of having a switch over. Begun in the um, excuse me, begun in the Black in Seattle project, and then continued um, in our Quarantine and Well Black project. And so um, I'm going to read her bio in just a second, but she was in a dialogue with one of our wonderful undergraduates who's actually online right now, Chardonnay Beaver, uh, who was doing an honors thesis uh, with, a, with Mary Gates, Mary Gates honors thesis. And um, I want to share just a little bit about Alexandria. Uh, and she has a wonderful bio. Alexandria takes pride in causing people to rethink their assumptions regarding blackness. As a native of the greater Seattle area, she is a proud sister, dog mom, auntie, business owner, and member of many communities. Alexandria is the epitome of a social butterfly, this is true, making friends everywhere she goes, from coffee shops to hiking trails to the opera. She loves food, travel, family time, and belongs to two book clubs, enjoys running 16 half marathons and counting, and is learning to snowboard. <laughs> After 20 plus years of working in the hair industry, Alexandria recently created and launched Soul Collective. <laughs> Give it up. A hair salon that provides an environment for stylists of varying skill sets to deliver exceptional service in a diverse salon. Soul Collective welcomes all clients, regardless of hair texture and type, race, or ethnicity. Soul Collective is located in the heart of Seattle's Central District and arrived just in time to contribute to redefining the neighborhood. And there are a number of us, including Holly, who, who the lovely locks are done, myself, Laura, nephew, right there. All right. So, Hair done by Alex. Okay, so um, so you can take a seat. Thank you. So we're gonna we're gonna listen to um, to Alex's clip here. Um, again, this was a part of um, Chardonnay's project, and Chardonnay was really into it. Chardonnay is also uh, a native of Seattle, and she's doing a, a, a quarter right now in Washington D.C., making big moves. I like to say that Chardonnay will be president of this country someday. They know. They know. They know. Um, and Chardonnay was particularly interested in questions around, um, about not just being black in Seattle, but around gentrification and all different kinds of things. And I think had a really unexpected conversation with Alex. Understanding my blackness in Seattle. So I was born and raised here and I am black and always have been. So understanding my blackness is all that I know. Like yeah. I've never looked in the mirror and seen anything different, which I hope that never happens, <laughs> but, but myself. So there's that part. Um, as far as blackness and how it relates to Seattle, I think that for me, uh, it's it's interesting because it has evolved over years. Like as a kid, I was loosely aware of race being a thing or being a big deal or an issue. And that was often brought to my attention by Black people. My upbringing in Seattle is layered. There's a lot of components that go into, into um, me being who I am today and my childhood 
was not a smooth or like clean straight line. So I've had a mixed bag, non-traditional upbringing with views of a lot of different traditions all of my life. Mm. So the I understand my blackness because I have no choice. <laughs> um, and as far as Seattle is concerned, it's interesting. I was just speaking with someone about this. It is a, it's a, it's different. Our numbers are different. The percentage of African American people is low in the Seattle metropolitan area. Even the central district of the 80s, although there may have been like a bit of a greater concentration of black people, there were still a lot of non-Black people. That's the nature of Seattle and has been. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I understand it because that's who I am and how it relates to Seattle. It's only when I get to a, a city that has more Black people that I realize uh, how much non-blackness I've had in my life, you know, like for me going to the, going to Atlanta was my first, uh, like largely populated black experience. No, yeah, actually that's yeah. not true. That's not true. I did go to St. Louis. That was, I went to St. Louis when I was like 18 years old, but Atlanta was my first, like as an adult, really able to like absorb and understand what's going on around me. It's only then did I realize that my blackness was Pacific Northwest blackness, which is different than, you know, heavier numbers. Thank you. So we're gonna go ahead and, and do the same thing. Go ahead and um, turn, you can turn to the same person, you can turn and talk with another person. And again, the prompt is just, what did you hear? What did you hear? Um, going into our, our groups, our breakout groups as well, what did you hear? All right, you ready? Okay, so um, Alexandria, would you like to just answer questions? Yes. Okay, so Alexandria would like to answer questions, comments, thoughts. All right, and please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Jet. Um, Alexandria's nephew, so my question to you is, how did it feel to, well, did you have to cold switch like outside of the Pacific Northwest? Northwest, oh my God. <laughs> That's a great question, thanks, Jet. Um, yes, I think code switching is something that I've had to, or I think that a lot of people experience um, globally, you know, kind of pay attention to what environment you're in, who your audience is. So, yes, absolutely. So it's a great, a great connection between the two as well. Yeah. I'm Marcus, uh, most of you probably already know that. Um, and I, to pick up on that question, which is something we kind of talked about, um, because not everyone has been to a, a country or a place where there is a, a large population of black people, in terms of like, Louis here, like for example, my first time going to Atlanta, I was like, oh my goodness, what is this going on here? You know, but also there was this sense where people, some people were saying, hey, you talk proper, you know, are you, where are you from? You talk really proper, you don't sound like you're from Atlanta. So just kind of picking up on that, that first experience or, uh, you know, that experience of being in the community in a place where you see a large 
uh, population of black people and thinking in terms of like economics and stuff like, you know what I mean? The code switching in that sense, if I, in terms of authenticity. So I wanted to know if you wanted to speak towards that experience. Thank you, Marcus. Um, similar to you, when I got to Atlanta, I was like, oh my God, I had no idea. I, these, my people, <laughs> I am home. Um, but interesting enough, it was um, probably like a, a double-sided um, vibe concerning that. Like in one way, I felt like, yes, this is everything I've been looking for and this inspires me to, uh, I was more inspired to come back home and showcase my excellence here rather than packing it up to go and move and be with the excellence there. I um, thought this concentration could be spread around a little bit more, so let me be inspired and take that home. Um, but there was also very much so a feeling of being an other. So as I said in my conversation about the Pacific Northwest black, um, that definitely, it's a thing. Anyone who was born and raised here is uh, aware of that um, and how othered we can be when you travel south or east or, you know. Any other questions or, or comments here, points that resonated with folks? Jed has another one. I love you, Auntie. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Martin, you ready? So. <laughs> All right, so. Um, Martin was uh, one of our, our participants, um, like Alexandria, in um, our project that was uh, with NAM, and that, that, we, that we didn't realize was going to turn in the direction that it turned, but we were very happy um, that, that both of them stuck with us and did these dialogues. You also might have heard the difference in the quality of the sound, by the way, from the first to the second. The first ones, um, with, with Marvin and Marcus, we were actually in the studios at KUOW, and so had all the professional equipment there. We also have a very professional studio in the communication department, and um, the second one was on Zoom. And it was edited beautifully, um, probably by Anjali, but you can tell that, that it just, it sounds a little bit, it's a different type of a quality of, of sound. So you'll, you'll hear that as you go through our archive, you'll hear a little bit of some differences of sound. So um, Martin Welty here has entered his 32nd year of service with the Seattle Police Department. He is a sergeant in the Collaborative Policing Bureau responsible for a team of three liaisons representing the East African, LGBTQ, and Chinatown International District communities, as well as a team of five crime prevention coordinators. Martin represents the Seattle Police Department in several mandatory areas regarding the city's race and social justice initiative. He's held a myriad of assignments ran ranging from gang detective to a lead instructor of training. He has extensive experience in facilitation um, and offers courses such as Race, the Power of Illusion, Bias Free Policing, and Cultural Relevance, and, um, and does consulting around this work as well. And when we partnered with, um, with police officers, with, with Martin and went with, his, um, with a colleague of his, um, this was not uncontroversial, you can imagine, for um, other members of our, of our black community. And um, we really appreciated them staying in, in the conversation the entire time. And we're going to hear um, uh, a clip uh, that Martin did from the last uh, group of questions, which were around community care and um, this moment of dual pandemics. Uh, those of you all who participated in our Quarantining While Black conference will remember hearing this. Um, it's an, an incredibly powerful clip, um, so we'll go ahead and, and play it. Absolutely, you can sit there, yep.
honestly believe nobody's taking care of me except me and God. And hang on. Wow, I didn't think. I didn't think that'd come out like that. I guess for me, uh, the reason I say that is, uh, you know, we have um, we have a, a, a wellness unit now. Uh, they've enlarged it a little bit, and and the last couple of years we've had uh, classes on a thing called resilience. And I think that stuff has been important because in my career I have not had. Uh, we, we we've always talked about from policing perspective, you know, the ultimate goal is you want to go home alive at the end of your shift, right? So it's always sort of this, this, the ultimate uh, kind of, of thing that's either, you know, life or death. And we've never had anything that's been about, but what about just sort of the ongoing everyday trials and tribulations and the buildup of say someone like me for, you know, 30 years, uh, you know, in this profession. Uh, and so finally we're addressing some of that stuff. But the thing that is interesting about this is that in the, in the collective for the men and women of color on our department, we, we're in a time now where where our wellness is about policing as a profession, but doesn't really break it down and say, you know what, but we got all kinds of different policing people. We got women and we've got men and we've got uh, transgendered officers and we have members of the LGBTQ community. And, you know, we have uh, uh, men and women of color and we're all police. And that's important on that perspective. But this whole wellness impacts us all differently. And we haven't gotten to the point of where our wellness folks, I don't even know, we'll find out soon, but I don't even know if they even think that way. I think they're just thinking from the perspective of our profession, right? That we're police and as police, here's all things that police in common will, will or could be impacted by and we want to take care of that. But not diving in even deeper to say, but we have unique people. We're not all one type of a police person. And, uh, you know, so what kind of things do we have to do to to help different kinds of police people? We, we are hopefully going to change that. Perfect. Perfect. So um, let's go ahead and I know. Okay. So we're going to go and do um, our, our, our quick third turn and talk. So go ahead. Um, you can find another partner. We're back with your same partner. What did you hear? What did you hear? And I think that... Um, Martin just wanted to answer questions, unless you want to talk now. No, any questions? Yeah, questions, please. We're ready over here. And um, hello, I'm Marvin. Um, and these are not really questions. These are more just comments, reflection on our rich dialogue. Um, we spoke about policing of black and brown bodies in the black community, you know, and how that's, you know, played a role in all of our lives at some point. Um, and the relationship between law enforcement and the black community, you know, so it's easy to kind of demonize in a sense or otherize law enforcement. I don't even want to say demonize like some of it's unwarranted, you know, but just to speak to that relationship, it's hard for us to see the person behind the badge, you know, unless you have a relationship with someone in law enforcement or like in my current profession, I work with law enforcement a lot of the time, you know, to help serve the community when we look at alternatives to policing or, you know, alternatives for community support. But if you don't have that relationship, it's very hard to see the person behind the badge, you know. And in this clip, I kind of heard that breakdown, you know. Um, the conversation went in a few different directions, you know. We also talked about just my reflection as a black man, I can relate to that breakdown, you know feeling like as a black man in America, I always have to be strong. 
you know, I can't be vulnerable, you know, and to hear that breakdown, you know, I can relate to that even though I'm not in law enforcement, you know, it wasn't that same breakdown, but I can relate to that, you know, and so just it's important to be able to see the person behind the badge because a lot of times you don't get a chance to do so. You're just judging off of your experiences with law enforcement. Hi, I'm Christy. Hi. Um, the thing that really struck me was that just that very beginning where you, you did just break down by talking about it. And I interpreted it, and let me know if this is even correct, but it was like you were, you were about to talk about the wellness stuff, right? And it was just that thought of there being just a little bit of relief from that almost like cumulative trauma of doing that work day in, day out, right? Um, just this idea that there's a little bit of safety in that, a little bit of relief, was huge for you. And um, I don't know, that just really made an impact on me. So. Usually, I, usually I have a really big voice. <laughs> My bad. Hi. Uh, thank you again, and it goes back to a point that Marvin had made. Um, I had 14 years of military experience. And so, uh, and, and my dad was a very gregarious big guy and uh, was a World War II veteran and, and had that persona of, you just suck stuff up, you know? No matter what life brings you, you just pick yourself back up, dust yourself off and, and, and go on. And, and I think uh, all of us have, have um, uh, can relate to that in some form or fashion. Uh, but I think, again, I'm old. I may be one of the oldest people in here. I'm I just turned 59, okay? Thank, thank you. Thank, she, she said, you don't look but like 40. I was like, thank you. Um, so so I'm, I'm an old guy, and I think in that moment in time, I, I can actually remember every time I, I hear this again, um, it, it was actually a, a dialogue between myself and, and a coworker uh, 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 that we were being asked the same, the same question, and it was my turn to answer. And it you're absolutely right. It just hit me because my brain said, wow, who do I really have? Like, who, who watches out for me, right? Who, who actually cares about me? Even though I've got family, friends, coworkers that I know do that, but it just really, something hit me really deep, probably for 57 years of a life uh, at that time, that just did hit me, and it was just a really emotional release. Uh, and a good one, I might add. I'm a big fan that um, w we all uh, need to deal with our emotions. Um, uh, someone had mentioned, uh, I, th I think it was uh, Marvin as well, in, in their conversation about code switching, and it made me think about at age 59, uh, and I've done a myriad of different things, I still get upset that I have to have conversations with out that have a particular outcome that I even have to think about, hey, is the color of this beautiful skin of mine an impact of this outcome that I'm experiencing? So in some ways, I don't know if that ever ends. It just comes down to how we as individual people love each other and this resilience, this wellness piece, how, how we within ourselves find a way to just navigate. Like it never goes away. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I thank you for kind of picking that out because it's very true. P plus the point about relation, you know, um, my department where there's some of us that are really moving into this, and it's not a new concept, we just make new words about stuff, but relational policing, I'm a simpleton, I tell people all the time uh, that it's, it, what really matters, um, it's how we're treated, it's not outcomes. And yet everything that we seem to do in a lot of businesses is all about data-driven, outcome-driven versus it really should be about building relationships with each other because how we're treated is in fact far more important than the actual outcomes that occur. So thank, thank you for that question. Uh, several people in the chat also resonated um, with what you said, Martin. And um, uh, Patrick writes, I'm glad, Martin, that your emotions came out. It's okay for black men, um, black folk to cry out loud. Lord knows we do too much in silence. 
Um, yeah, and several, several other people, um, Allison writes, wow, powerful, um, appreciate the humanity offered. Um, yes, and, and Chardonnay also echoes many of those comments. Any, any other question or comment? Yep. The, the last piece of the comment also was to remember that it's okay to not be okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. So with that, um, we want to, um, to transition into uh, the, the final portion of the evening, which includes tacos, which we promised you. I know we promised it. It took, it took too long, but, but we do have tacos for you. Um, we would uh, love it if um, you could please leave a post-it. Um, Jazz, I don't know if you want to come to the front again to, to share, share the prompts. And um, this year we are engaging in the, the, the topic. We, we ended with, with Martin's clip because really this is what we're working on this year, is thinking through um, this new project that we have that's called um, Resistance Through Resilience and the relationship between the two and in particular for, um, for black and brown folks, how do we continue to resist but how do we take care of ourselves in the process? Um, and so this is what we're, we're going to be working on. Uh, if you are interested in joining up any of our projects, we probably will not have public projects for this year, but we will have some more starting next year as we'll be building up with our, our Black Capitalism project and then expanding um, our Resistance Through Resilience project as well. So thank you so much to everyone um, who is participating online as well. Um, we hope that you all got a little bit of the feel of the evening too. Uh, if you have an opportunity to tweet out your reflections about how you engage in radical listing, the posters back there are talking about um, how do you, what is your interrupting privilege in action look like and how do you engage in radical listening. Uh, if you wanted to tweet those out to at UWCCDE, that would be terrific. If you are not on Twitter, I know we have an intergenerational audience um, online, you'll be getting a survey and um, you can put your answers in there so you can jot it down on a piece of paper and then in the next couple of days you will be getting a survey where you can enter that in as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, goodbye to our online crew. Thank you so much to everyone who is helping us here today, to our wonderful live streaming crew who's been making all of the magic happening. And th thank you to, to all of the hands, to, um, to Josh, of course, for making this happen. I, we would not have had an event if it, was, if it was not for Josh. Josh has hit the ground running in this job. He's been absolutely amazing. Um, Jazz to, um, to Caleb and then to our wonderful volunteers here tonight as well, to Laura, to Anjali, and to Michelle online. Thank you so much. And um, those of you who are here, enjoy some tacos. We wish we could share them with the online folks and have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>